Uh, well, thank you, Dean. Uh, great introduction there. Uh, you know, myself, Matt Bumbla uh, with Price Industries. I've been with Price for about 14 years, uh, overall about 20 years uh, in the HVAC industry. Like Dean said, the goal today is to talk about decoupled uh, cooling systems. We'll get into the, you know, the details or the weeds of it, you know, how it relates to what's happening today with the changing code requirements um, and the global uh, global warming uh, potential and how these systems could help. Uh, before we get started with that, we just want to take 10, 15 minutes to talk about price and introduce uh, price industries to you guys. You know, where do we come from and what's our history and how do we go about doing business? Um, so essentially starting off uh, with, you know, um, our history as a company, we started back in uh, the 1940s as a rep organization in Winnipeg, uh, Canada. Yes, it's very cold there, minus 40 degrees. So we know a little bit about, uh, you know, uh, heating buildings uh, and conditioning our buildings. We've been, we've been doing it for a while. Like I said, we started off as a sales organization, and you could see these are some of the key milestones we hit as we went along. Uh, we evolved from being a sales organization to uh, in the 1970s decided to get into manufacturing. Uh, you know, what drove that was essentially being able to service our customers. Uh, what, what we found was the manufacturers at the time that we were repping, uh, we couldn't serve our contractors, our clients the way we wanted to, uh, especially when it came to uh, lead time and getting products uh, out on job sites in a timely manner. That's what drove our move into uh, being able to manufacture our products. Um, and it's a very similar story, story as you go on as well. Uh, you know, once we started manufacturing, we were selling product across Canada, and then we saw the same potential with the US market. And that's where in the 1990s is when the company decided to expand into uh, the US market. Again, we saw similar potential in the US market. We thought we could bring real value in terms of being able to uh, you know, provide the service that the market deserved uh, and hence create a place for ourselves as well. So that's what helped us you know, grow our you know, legacy business. You know, what we call legacy business is our air distribution side of things. You think about grills, diffusers, VAV boxes, fan powered boxes and all that good stuff. Uh, but by the time we got into the 90s, we had established ourselves in the Canadian and the US market. And what we started to see was that there was a, you know, a little bit of a shift in terms of where the HVAC systems were going. And essentially what was happening was the industry was using VAV all air systems for a long, long time. Uh, and now there was a need to do things a little bit differently. There were, you know, th that was driven by a lot of different factors. Some clients needed more flexibility with their HVAC systems as they were trying to reconfigure their spaces. Other clients were just looking for, uh, you know, more energy efficient systems. And a lot of it was also influenced and driven by the European market as well, which tends to be a little ahead of us when it comes to energy efficiency. So what we uh, you know, found was that we had to start thinking outside of the box and get out of the, uh, the, the VAV box uh, or the all air environment and expand into other product categories. That's where we added a lot of research and development capabilities in the early 2000s. We thought that was important. I'll talk a little more about that as we go on, uh, because as you go in and develop new technologies, there's two options you have. You could use third party labs to test your product or you could develop your own lab, uh, you know, you know, which means you know higher upfront capital costs. But the advantage it brings is you're able to, you know, test the product a lot quicker um, and create a lot more data, you know, by being able to test uh, the product in your labs. So we chose the the the, the second route where we developed a lot of our lab, lab capabilities. Our lab up in Winnipeg is roughly about 30,000 square feet now, where we could literally test all our products ourselves. There's different chambers we use to test our product, and that allowed us to expedite, uh, you know, our uh, our capability of being able to launch new technologies. You know, I'll give you an example. You know, chill beams. When we first got into the chill beam business in roughly roughly about 20 years ago. You know, again, we could have sent all our products to Europe to get tested because the only lab at the time was in Europe, but we built the lab ourselves and we were able to launch the whole product category within a time period of two years, uh, which wouldn't have been possible um, otherwise. So, you know, again, all of that was driven by the need in the market and wanted to serve uh, the market. Last thing I would point out is as you get into, you know, being, you know, doing a lot of different types of systems, especially systems that are not as well understood, being able to support the engineering need is important. Uh, that's where we, 
you know, took took on initiatives initiatives like putting a lot of that information and know how on our website and compiling it uh, in our HVAC handbook as well, which hopefully you guys have a copy of. You know, if not, then we could definitely get it uh, for you guys as well. So that's a little bit about the company, uh, the history of the company itself. Uh, where are we located? Like I said, Winnipeg is where we started. That's where our biggest hub is. That's where our corporate headquarters are. Um, Atlanta is where Chris and I are from. Mark is based out of Winnipeg. Uh, Atlanta is our US head office. Uh, we've got a similar manufacturing footprint in Atlanta as well. Uh, we're at about four manufacturing facilities in Atlanta area. Um, a lot of the products that we'll talk about today are actually manufactured all in Atlanta, uh, you know, including our chill beams, our sensible, uh, you know, DOAS fan forward boxes. We also have a facility in Phoenix. Uh, that's where we mostly build products for our West Coast market, our commodity products that are required for the West Coast market for the proximity of uh, Phoenix uh, to the West Coast market itself. It's a pretty neat place, especially in winters when it's you know a little too cold and gloomy here. If you guys uh, you never want to take a trip out to Phoenix, I'm pretty sure Matt and the uh, the Buckley team can can make it happen for you guys. One other thing I would point out is some of these numbers are a little bit old. We're roughly at about a uh, billion dollars um, as we stand today in terms of our uh, annual revenue, and our actual manufacturing footprint is a little bit over 1.5 million square feet. We're still a privately held company, and that's how we're going to stay, uh, you know, in 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 the long term future as well. So, you know, what drives us? Hopefully, you guys kind of get the flavor of, uh, you know, what's behind price, and you know, what's brought us from where we were, uh, you know, our our humble beginnings, roughly about 60, 70 years ago. And at the essence of it is customer service. Uh, you know, we have a very, uh, you know, service driven culture, uh, driven by, uh, you know, our our CEO, Jerry Price, uh, he is, he makes a point of you being able to service you guys, service the projects, service our contractors, making sure the project is done well and worrying about, uh, you know, cost or implications uh, as, as an after uh, the fact thing uh, and, and taking care of the project first. Um, you know, some of the values that drive us, you know, integrity, trust, respect, you know, all of those you can imagine it's it's all about, you know, taking care of, of people, whether it's internal or externally, our clients like yourself that we're working with. Uh, what we believe in is uh, treating others the way we would like to get treated ourselves. Um, and we feel uh, as long as we take care of our clients and our people, everything else, including the business itself, will take care of itself. Um, all right, uh, you know, and, and you know, one of the big things with service uh, is, you know, uh, actually two big items is delivery excellence and new product. And again, you could, you know, hopefully you got the picture of that through the, the history conversation as well. Delivery excellence is important, you know, because there's always timelines on projects that have to be met. Sometimes they get aggressive. Uh, so we make a point of uh, making sure that we stay at the forefront of being able to deliver uh, our products in an effective, effective manner. The new products, that's where I was talking about being able to introduce new technologies and having research and development capabilities. Uh, that's been important to us and that's what helped us uh, relentlessly develop new products so we could serve you guys and the market um, at large. Um, how do we make it happen? One thing that we make a point of is, you know, manufacturing our products in North America. Our entire manufacturing uh, footprint is in US and Canada, which is very unique uh, to us in our industry. Most, if not all, our manufacturers uh, manufacture products uh, or have large footprints outside of US Canada for cost reasons. Labor is cheaper uh, elsewhere. Again, we make a point of staying here because we feel like we can have better control over the quality uh, and the delivery uh, excellence of our product if we're building it closer to where where we live and work. Uh, so the big question comes is how do we stay relevant? If we're building here, labor costs are high, how do we still make sure that you know pricing wise uh, we're we're competitive? And that's where our manufacturing processes and people come into play. We relentlessly invest into automating our process. Uh, so any product that's you know, that's a high volume product for us. You know, we try and do everything we can to automate the process uh, to again, control the cost and still be an effective, uh, you know, bidder uh, when it comes to, uh, to the bid day. Uh, one other thing, um, you know, again, hopefully you guys have already got a little bit of a flavor of it. Um, everything that you see on the screen here, we do in-house, we do it all ourselves. 
We talked about research and development. That picture that you see is from our hydronic test chamber up in Winnipeg. That's where all our chill beams are tested. And we have done tests for you know, custom um, requirements on projects as well. Again, because we've got the lab and we could set it up and 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 do it that way. We write our own software. We have a software team that doesn't just write our ERP software codes. They actually write all our uh, you know uh, customer interaction softwares as well, uh, including our uh, our chill beam uh, selection software and our uh, thermal unit selection software. We manufacture our own water coils. All those coils that you know, end up on our uh, fan power boxes and chill beams are all built uh, down in Atlanta, same plant where the product is put together. We do our own controls. All of that is in-house, and this is not taking a third-party controller, putting our sticker on it. When we say we do our controls, we manufacture the entire thing, including the hardware um, and the, the software for it. And aluminum extrusion and anodizing are, are, are two other things that we also do in-house, which not always relevant for chill beams, but if you guys work with linear bar grills, you know, we don't buy extrusions from elsewhere and then just make the product. We actually make the extrusion as well and anodize and finish it ourselves uh, before we before we assemble that product. And again, all of that, you know, was driven by being able to service you guys, being able to service your projects. All of that makes us that much more effective. Hopefully you guys could see the picture in terms of having the, the industry leading lead times and being able to release products um, at, a, at a fast pace. All right, uh, last but not least, before we move on to the next session, handbook. I talked about that a little bit. Uh, you know, if any of you guys do not have a handbook, please reach out to your Buckley rep. You know, we've got physical copies. It's also available online. You could register uh, to get a copy of it. There's, I think, rough 66 and a half hours of PDH credits. Uh, you know, we've made it available online, so you guys could, could you know, take those sessions wherever you are while you're sipping a coffee or while you're on the beach. I don't recommend doing it while you're on the beach, but if you wanted to, you could do that. It's available online. All right. Um, is, this, is this a decent time to take questions, Lindsay, or should we keep? Yeah, okay. Any questions on price as a company, our history? All right. Sounds like we're good. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll keep moving on. Um, planet to people. Low lift decoupled systems. Uh, you know, we, Dean and I talked a little bit about decoupled cooling systems. I just want to make sure before we get into the session, do we understand low lift or the term lift where it comes from? More context? Okay. Um, so, what we mean by low lift is if you think about a chiller, right? Uh, you know, when we size a chiller, uh, you know, especially to think about your cooling the space, uh, an air source chiller, your ambient condition is say 100 degrees and you're trying to, you know, create 42 degree chilled water uh, using that chiller. That's basically your lift, you know, going from, from 100 to 42 degrees, right? The lower that lift is, the, the more energy efficient your systems could be. We'll talk a lot more about that and that plays into decoupled cooling systems, but that's kind of the context. When we say low lift, we mean systems that could um, uh, that could help heat pumps and chillers work at a lower lift so they could be more efficient and hence the entire system could be more efficient. That's kind of the context there. We'll talk more about that as we go on. Um, so this slide, you know, I'll take 10, 15 minutes to just kind of, you know, set the context in terms of, you know, why we're having this conversation. Why is there such a push, uh, you know, with decarbonization? You know, we'll talk about what's happening at the planet level. There's only one planet we have, and it's important we look after it. Uh, you know, I think it's worth spending five minutes talking about it. How do buildings play into it? Um, you know, and then how do HVAC systems uh, play within the, the built environment? Um, just a side note, Justin's not here. He's our marketing guy. This is not my version of what an HVAC system looks like. <laughs> this is the marketing guy's version of what HVAC systems look like. But what we're talking about is the systems that we design in our buildings. Um, and then last but not least, we'll spend the most time talking about us. What can we do? Uh, you know, what can low lift decoupled uh, systems do uh, and how you could use those on your projects to make a difference? Uh, that's what the, the last piece would be. All right, so starting with the planet, um, oh, the slide is coming. Okay, there it is. Um, so what this, there's a lot that's happening on this slide. Just, just follow along with me here. Uh, what you're seeing at the bottom is the CO2 concentration uh, around uh, around the planet, around Earth, 
and on the left on the, uh, the the y axis is the temperature rise that we have seen uh, on uh, on average uh, around the globe as well and essentially since 1880s over the last 150 uh, years we've added enough um, carbon dioxide or carbon into the environment where the ppm levels have gone from being just below 300 to being over 400 ppm more like 420 um, and to provide some more context if you go back 8,500 years, it's always been below 300. It's it's over the last 150 years where something different has has, has happened that's, that's caused that to the environment. Now, when I first saw it, my first reaction was, well, what if this gets to, to the levels where we can't just breathe, uh, you know, uh, clean air anymore? It gets so toxic that it would be hard for us to, uh, uh, to survive. But the fact is things would get a lot worse lot sooner than that you know again to provide some more context uh, in a built environment we're looking for ppms of a thousand ppm or lower to you know maintain cognitive ability uh, of, of us as human beings being able to stay as as sharp as we can to do what we want to do in our buildings so that's you know quite a quite a distance away you know we're we're less than half the way there uh, you know but the bigger problem here is as we increase the co2 levels the temperature is rising um, and you know again uh, you know, what's happening here is every 10 ppm of concentration that we, we add on Earth, that translates to roughly about 0.1 degrees T of, of temperature rise uh, on Earth, right? Um, right now, we're roughly, we're just above 1 degree C temperature rise, and we're already starting to see uh, the effects of it. Uh, the Paris Agreement, which was in 2015, has stipulated, in a worst case, we want to stay below 2 degree C temperature rise because past 2 the, the, the global uh, environment change would be irreversible. Uh, but what the real goal that they've set for us is no higher than 1.5 uh, degree C addition to the to global warming. And the reason for that is, uh, you know, if you look at this, you know, um, essentially this shows the difference or the significance of half a degree. Uh, if you were, if, if, if the earth, the global warming was to be two instead of 1.5, that half a degree will mean twice as many plant species would cease to exist, three times as many insects would cease to exist, and we would have a lot worse, 10 times uh, um, worse the, 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 the environment patterns uh, on Earth. You know, we'll see storms uh, that would traditionally happen once in 100 years that would start to happen you know, a lot sooner, more like once in 10 years. And that's what we're dealing with. And essentially what that means is if we get to that point, uh, more than half the Earth that's habitable right now will become inhabitable. Uh, you know, it will have huge impact uh, on um, on our ability to uh, to thrive on the planet. So that's a little bit about the planet. Um, you know, buildings. How do they play into it? What's their carbon footprint? What's the future solution? Uh, you know, buildings play a big role uh, in terms of um, adding CO2 emissions on Earth. Um, so this graph. You know, all of this comes from ASHA 2030. They've done a lot of research, uh, and there's a lot of scientists uh, that are on the panel that have, you know, fed into all this information. Essentially, there's three big factors, transportation, industry, and the built environment. And built environment is more than one-third uh, of the country, but almost 40% in terms of globally, uh, in terms of CO2 emissions being added uh, on the earth itself. That's why buildings are important in the context of what we're talking about here. And that's why that's where ASHRAE, uh, sorry, Architectural 2030 back in two, 2005 came into prominence because once we realized buildings were, uh, you know, a big part of, you know, the problem and also hence the future solution, uh, you know, uh, Architecture 2030 came into existence because of that reason. Uh, what Architect Architecture 2030 or 2030 Challenge stipulated, uh, you know, again, it came up out in 2005. The goal originally was to start bu building our new buildings and major renovations carbon neutral by 2030. That was the original goal. Uh, but very soon we realized, and we already talked about a lot of this, uh, you know, by the time we got to 2015, we had realized that that half degree makes a big difference. So that goal has shifted. Instead of have you know being able to wait till 2030 and have a little bit of a ramp before we have carbon neutral buildings we don't have time and we need to act now we need to start building carbon neutral buildings now to have a chance at you know not ca not causing irreversible damage um, to the planet um, all right so what does the new goal look like uh, you know you could see where the 2030 marker is uh, so the new goal 
if we want to have a 50 percent um, chance of not causing irreversible um, damage, we basically have to become net zero by 2040. Now, that may seem like the um, the scale shifted for it becoming a little more easier. That's not true because the original goal for 2030 was to start building carbon neutral by 2030. The goal here is to convert everything, existing, new, all projects to carbon neutral by 2040, you know, for us to have a chance at what we're trying to uh, trying to achieve here. Now, everything is not doom and gloom. I'm sorry, I had to create this picture. Uh, so, so we had the context of what we're talking about here. Uh, things are moving in the right direction, thanks to a lot of these initiatives that started a few years ago. Uh, you know, again, architectural 2030 since 2005, just in the US, you know, there's been substantial reduction in CO2 emissions, both on the commercial and the residential side. So we're making progress, we're doing something right. Um, at the same time, you know, some more context here. We've added roughly about 22 and a half percent floor area um, in the US over the last uh, 25 years, uh, but our energy consumption has dropped by three and a half percent. So we've added more buildings, but we're consuming less than what we did, uh, you know, um, 25 years ago. So we definitely have become a lot more energy efficient. At the same time, our CO2 emissions have gone down by roughly uh, almost about 30% uh, over those years, again, while we have built uh, more buildings. Um, you know, anytime you start doing something the first time, you start doing something the new way, it always costs more, right? Um, you know, just being able to figure things out, uh, you know, just being able to use new products and, uh, you know, build your project, your systems around those. So first cost is always a concern, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's everything is going to cost more. Uh, this kind of provides a picture of what's hap happened to operational energy cost over the last 12 years. Um, you know, based on these calculations, we've as 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 a nation nation as a whole, we have saved roughly about five hundred thirty billion dollars over the last twelve years in operational cost. Again, because of all the changes that we have made over the last twenty five years. So now the question becomes, what have we done that's helped, right? Uh, and what really is the uh, the direction going forward? If you look at existing buildings. Uh, you know, again, the projections are two thirds of the building that are there today will exist in 2040. You know, so if we want to be carbon neutral in 2040, all those have to be carbon neutral, right? How do we get there? Uh, there's basically three things and, and you'll start to see a theme here. One is, you know, convert them into being more energy efficient uh, buildings as you renovate those buildings, um, eliminate fossil fuel, uh, you know, so you're taking fossil fuel out of the building, so you're not adding carbon at the building location itself. And then, uh, you know, at the same time, taking our grids and making them cleaner, uh, you know, um, replacing dirtier grids with cleaner renewable grids, you know, so you're you know, kind of, you know, attacking it from, from two different angles. Same thing with new construction. <clears throat> we are expected to double our building stock over the next 40 years. <laughs> to provide some context, that's roughly adding a New York City every month. That's what we're doing right now globally. We're adding a New York City every month in terms of the uh, the built environment, and again, it's 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 the same exact three items where we got to build those more energy efficiently, we got to eliminate fossil fuel, and we have to have uh, renewable energy uh, sources, and that's what basically it comes down to, and that's where a lot of the push that we see with uh, electrification um, and also energy efficient buildings. This is what it stems down to. We got to build our buildings more efficiently, electrification. It's been a little bit of a controversial topic. It's still got its, um, uh, you know, its, its issues that need to be resolved. For example, working with ambient conditions in a climate like Boston. Also, there still are some dirty grids out there, but the point is, you know, if we keep adding uh, carbon at every building location, it's a lot harder to go to every building and eliminate it. But if we clean the building itself, and then at the same time, clean the source, you know, it gives us a better and a quicker chance of, uh, you know, of, of, of building a, a carbon free uh, environment. So that's a little bit about buildings, you know, how do HVAC systems play into it? Um, you guys, I'm not sure if you guys have heard of it, but it's, it's probably not as popular term. There's a thing called 40, 40, 40 rule. Uh, you know what that is, the first 40 is buildings are 40% of the, the energy consumed or carbon added globally. And HVAC systems are 40% of the energy used by buildings. And the last 40 is 
the uh, the for, the forty percent of the energy consumed by the HVAC system goes towards the ventilation system, right? And we'll talk about the ventilation system, uh, but it's the second forty is why we're talking about HVAC systems, um, and they've got a lot of attention because of that reason. And essentially, you know, this graph does a good job of showcasing what we have done over the last 20, 25 years. This is ASHRAE 90.1, which is the energy standard uh, for, for ASHRAE. It started back in 1975, you know, when the oil embargo happened. Not much happened over the next few years until we hit about the early 2000s. That's when we got more conscious about becoming more energy efficient and made a point of reducing our energy usage uh, with every uh, iteration of that standard. And essentially what happens with 90.1 is every three, year, three years you get a new standard. Uh, and there's stipulations in terms of how much you wanna reduce the energy consumption with it. And the way the standard does it is 2004 is established, been established as the baseline. So every three years when they're setting goals for the next standard, they go back to 2004 and say, okay, for this version, we want to be 40% more efficient than 2004. And that's essentially what 2019 was. The 2019 standard is roughly about, on average, um, about 40% more efficient than the baseline 2004 standard, which I think, if I'm not wrong, Boston and Massachusetts use the 2090.1, already is using 90.1 2019 um, as the energy standard. It might be IECC 2021 uh, for some projects, and that translates also translates to 90.1 2019. It, they're both the uh, the same thing. Okay, um, you know. So, but what's happening across the country? I think it's good to have this context. This map is from December 2018. Uh, you could see where different states were in terms of, uh, you know, which standards um, they were uh, they were using at the time. Fast forward four and a half years. This is what the map looks like uh, today. Uh, it's from. It might actually already have changed because this is from April. I think Pennsylvania recently adopted, uh, you know, uh, the uh, the 2016 standard as well. This shows it to be 2013. Uh, but you could you could see how greener we have become, uh, you know, as as a country um, at the state level as well. Some states still have to catch up, you know. But you could kind of see the trend where, uh, you know. Where are the trendsetters? You could clearly see West Coast, Northeast, especially Massachusetts. Kudos to you guys. Uh, you know, have been leading the charge with energy efficiency, uh, and slowly that's catching on uh, throughout the rest of the country for all the different reasons that uh, that we just talked about. So that's a little bit about the energy codes. What's happening there? Um, electrification. You know, that's that's the the second big thing that's become more prominent. Over the last five years, what this map shows is 10 states and a lot of different cities that already have mandates around electrification. Those mandates look different, their targets are a little bit different, but they've already defined how what they are uh, aiming for and how they're expecting all, all their buildings in their cities to uh, to get to that point. Um, you know, you could hopefully see the, the, the pattern here as well. All of it is starting in the Northeast and the West Coast again, uh, and we feel, it's going to catch on and spread through uh, through the rest of the country as well. Just to give you guys a little bit of a flavor, I think you guys may have heard some of this. Uh, you know, Massachusetts, Boston. Uh, you know, there's this lots that's happening. Like I said, you guys are already using 2019, but even from electrification pers perspective, uh, you know, the stretch uh, the stretch code is going to be pushing uh, for 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 these systems and also uh, asking for to make these buildings uh, more, you know, carbon fossil fuel free uh, you know as as we as we move along so that's a little bit about electrification um, if we think that it's you know it's it's caught on fire over the last few years you know wait till we see what happens over the next 5 years inflation reduction act that came out last year uh, what that did was it put 370 billion dollars uh, behind uh, combating climate change. We've, no one has ever put that kind of money uh, you know, uh, behind one cause. And some of the key items for us to be aware of, uh, 179D, that's a tax deduction uh, incentive. Uh, so if you guys have clients that want to push the envelope and go beyond the energy code, depending on how far they go beyond the energy code, there's some money that they could claim in their tax deduction. And it could be as much as $2.5 per square foot uh, for, for these clients. 
Um, energy codes, I feel like this is the biggest one uh, because things don't change until the codes change. We all know that very well. Um, so what's happening here is uh, out of that 370 billion, uh, there's roughly a billion that the federal government has put aside for states and jurisdictions that need help to update their codes. So all those states that were sitting back because they felt like they didn't have resources, they've got money available uh, to, uh, to find those resources uh, and up, update uh, their codes. Last but not least, federal buildings. Um, federal government is leading from the front. Uh, they put $3 billion aside to upgrade the, all their buildings uh, to newer systems you know, that might not comply with where things are right now. Um, so yeah, that's what's happening with the Inflation, uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Um, the other point I wanted to make was, you know, we talked about this, we know what's happening there. Uh, this Architecture 2030 has also translated into MEP 2040. Are any of you guys signatories to MEP 2040 by any chance? No, okay. Uh, there are a few consulting firms that have signed up with MEP 2040, and essentially what that is is, uh, you know, becoming net zero carbon or carbon neutral operationally by 2030 with with all our HVAC systems that we design and uh, embodied carbon by 2040. Uh, that's essentially the goal uh, with this time, which is right in line with where we need to be uh, by 2040. All right. Um, any questions at this point before we move into uh, some of the product system discussion? All right, we'll keep going. Um, how can we lead the charge? There is some pun intended there. Um, electrification, the charge associated with it. Uh, how do we take it further from here? Uh, you know, hopefully we understand where electrification comes into play. Traditionally, we have been used to um, heating our buildings using fossil fuel, some sort of fossil fuel at the location, natural gas, boilers, you know, um, uh, heating up water up to 180 degrees to create heating uh, within our buildings, right? How do we go away from that? How do we electrify our buildings and still effectively heat and cool our buildings? Um, so what comes into play is heat pumps. How many of us have worked with heat pumps on projects? Guys have. Okay. All right. So yeah, we're you know so we're you know we'll you know feel free to ask any questions as you go on. I'm not a heat pump expert. That's not what the intent of this presentation is. I'm trying to provide a context of what we're dealing with when we're working with heat pumps. You know, there's a good reason why we're using them. But the bigger point here is what are some of the technologies. Uh, that we have available uh, at price that might help uh, complement and or, or supplement uh, heat pump technologies. But essentially the way at a high level how a heat pump works is it uses refrigeration cycle to add heating within the building. Refrigeration cycle uh, is being used to add cooling to the building for many, many years, you know, almost over a century, uh, you know, but you could now reverse the cycle um, and use it for, for heating the building as well. That's essentially what a heat pump is. That could do both heating and cooling. It could be, you could be doing it separately at different times, or in some cases you could do simultaneous uh, heating and cooling as well. How do they work? There is the cooling mode and the heating mode shown here. Uh, and essentially, uh, you know, the, the driver here is the reversing valve. What you see on the left side is what you typically would expect from a cooling cycle for any chiller, right? You basically have your compressor, you know, that's pumping refrigerant through the system. The if it's an air source chiller, you're um, you know you're using the the coil and the fan to exchange heat or put heat out back into the ambient, and and your heat exchanger is where you exchange the heat with uh, with water and send that water into the building to to cool the building. Very typical. Now, what the reversing valve does is it allows you to reverse that cycle uh, instead of just, you know, sending, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, cooling into the building. Now you could reverse the cycle where you actually uh, take heat from the ambient and put it into the building. And that's how you, you essentially end up heating the building. Uh, in most cases, uh, you're essentially using water. You would heat it up to whatever is possible with a heat pump and then pump it into the building to some sort of a system inside the building to uh, heat your space. Um, there's a heat recovery version available for these heat pumps as well. Uh, the way it works is it's got a heat recovery uh, condenser 
uh, which could it could only be used when you have a simultaneous cooling load in the building. But essentially what it does is it provides you some free heating when you need both heating and cooling uh, in the building. So there's some additional benefits uh, with heat recovery chillers uh, that could be had. Uh, the bigger point I wanted to make was, uh, you know, what are the operating ranges uh, for these heat pumps? We all know how they work uh, in the cooling environment. You know, they've been using those for many, many years. But when it comes to heating, you know, that's what we need to pay attention to. You know, hopefully you guys have, uh, you know, have had similar experiences. We'd love to get your feedback on it too. But essentially what's happening is typically your hot water range that you could create to heat the building with heat pumps is 75 to 140 degrees. Now, that not, might not be true for every single manufacturer. Some may claim different ranges. Again, that's not the point in terms of what exactly could be done, but this is the generally accepted range uh, that you could do. What you will notice on this graph is that's what this, this is showing here, roughly about 75 to 140. Uh, 140 is the max you could do, but based on your ambient conditions, you know, especially below uh, you know, 47 degrees, the, what you could create starts to drop very quickly, uh, you know, and in Boston, we're dealing with ambient conditions that are a lot lower than 47. Hence, you would be dealing with, uh, you know, being able to create certain, uh, you know, degree of, of hot water, uh, which might not be 140 uh, for your projects. Uh, and that's important to, to understand because it's very different than what it was a few years ago with boilers, where you could create 180 degree water. Now you have to be able to work with a lot lower temperatures. Uh, you know, because that's a limitation that that heat pumps have. One other point I wanted to make was this comes right out of ASHRAE 90.1 2019. That's when this table was added in the 2019 version. It's the heat pump efficiency requirement. What we generally see is projects being around, designed around the middle or the medium range, you know, temperatures around 120 degrees or maybe even higher. And what you would notice is if you're able to push that temperature even lower, say 105 or lower, you could achieve as much as 15 to 18% higher efficiency with your heating plant, you know, just by going to, uh, to a lower, um, lower uh, entering water temperature uh, on, the, uh, on the heating side. So something to keep in mind, um, you know, uh, now the question is what's happening here? How does that work? And essentially, if we go back to the refrigerant cycle, which we're, looking at here, this essentially is what your lift is, right? So the two different temperatures you're working with, you know, let's say for heating outdoors at zero degrees and you're trying to create 140 degree water, right? You're creating a certain lift. You're going from zero, you're taking, you're trying to create 140. That's the range, right? Uh, based on the lift, you would have a certain work supplied that you, the energy that you would have to put into the heat pump to create uh, that kind of heating. Uh, now, if you were to drop that temperature from 140 to 120, now that area reduces, which means you could create the same amount of heating with less work. And that's where low lift comes into play, and that's how it helps, uh, you know, make our system a lot more efficient. And that's essentially what we're talking about. Another way of looking at it is if this is 75, which is a set point we're trying to achieve in the space, on the heating side, you're basically going 140, right? That's a certain amount of lift, lift compared to what's in the space versus 120, right? So your lift is smaller and you're more efficient. In cooling, you still want to maintain 75, but you're going in the other direction. So if you go to 42, that's a certain amount of lift. Instead, if you go to 55, that's a lower lift. And that's how you become more efficient on the cooling side as well with a lower lift. And that's what's uh, you know shown uh, on, on this slide, you know, this is actually for a project in New York City. It's a large, uh, you know, um, corporation, their head office um, in, in Hudson Yards. Uh, what they did was they used two different chillers. There's a 42 degree chiller, which is used to uh, cool at the DOAS unit, to dehumidify the air at the DOAS unit. And they, then they had a separate chiller doing 55 degree water, which was supplied to underfloor chill beams. Uh, around the perimeter and the fan columns. We'll talk about that system in a little bit. And essentially what that meant was 26% uh, efficiency increase going from 42 to 55 degrees. And roughly, and you know, talk to your heat pump chiller manufacturers, they'll tell you the same thing. For every degree drop uh, or raise, uh, raising the, the chilled water temperature means 2% increase in the efficiency of the cooling plant um, itself. Now, keep in mind, it's the cooling plant, not the entire system. At the entire system level, you know, it would be a little bit different, uh, but at least plant is becoming 
um, a lot more efficient. Right, and that's where low lift uh, is important, right? So hold your thought on low lift and keep those two temperatures in mind, 55 and 105. You know, we just saw traditionally, again, we're used to 180, 140 with heat pumps and then 42 with chilled waters, right? And we just saw how you, t if you take that and drop it to 105 and 55, what it could do to our system efficiency. We'll come back to this and see how some of the other systems can help um, with that. So. What are those systems that could help? Decoupled uh, cooling systems, they could, they could definitely provide a lot of benefits there. What is a decoupled cooling system? Dean touched on it a little bit. This graphic explains it uh, you know, a, a little bit as well. What you see on the left side is your traditional all air system where everything that you need to do, your entire load has to be taken care of at the coil uh, on the air handling unit. Once you cool all of that air, then it has to be brought uh, into all the different spaces to provide heating and cooling in the space, right? That's what we've been doing traditionally, and it's a very common system. Um, how would you decouple? You know, this, the, the, the portion on the right side, you know, there's this one way of doing it with chill beams. It shows how that would happen. Instead of having uh, an air handling unit, we now have a DOAS unit, which only does the ventilation and the latent load. So it's, it, you still have to bring your, your outdoor air into the building, and you have to condition it as well. So that's what's happening at the DOAS unit. You would need a chiller, which then would feed 55, 57 degree water to chill beams and the rest of the sensible cooling and the heating happens within the space itself. And that's why it's called a decoupled cooling system. You're not doing everything at the air handling unit. There's only a portion that happens at the DOAS unit, rest happens within the space, right? And that's got some benefits, which we'll talk about uh, in a minute. Um, how does a chill beam work? Yeah, essentially, what's happening there is this is your primary air coming in through your DOAS unit. You know, again, it's taking care of the ventilation and the latent load. And then it goes through a nozzle bank, which creates negative pressure behind the coil, and that induces return air over the coil. And this coil could be a four pipe or a two pipe coil, so you could do both heating and cooling through this coil itself. So, to put things into perspective, uh, you know, you can have an induction ratio at this beam anywhere from two to six, depending on what you need to do within the space. The example uses an induction ratio of four. So what that means is if you've got 50 CFM of outdoor air coming in, the actual air going into the space is 250. The other 200 is what was induced from the room side, and that's how you create induced air uh, at the beam itself. Uh, what generally ends up happening is um, you end up moving actually even more air than a traditional all air system using chill beams. Um, so with an overhead system, you, you may only have needed 200 CFM to condition that space overall, but that 200 CFM is coming in at 55 degrees, right? And which has certain implications. But with chill beams, because you're inducing so much, that 250 uh, CFM that's leaving the beam is actually uh, in early 60s in terms of its temperature. It's somewhere around 60, 64 degrees, which makes it a lot more better from comfort perspective. There's less draft concerns. It's not very cold, 55 degree air. It's a lot more comfortable and you're moving more air uh, within the space as well. Um, and obviously, you know, uh, once you, you've got these chill beams, just the way you will lay out your diffusers, you will lay your chill beams out across the floor plate. Uh, based on how your zones are set up, and then each zone would have a, its own decoupled environment where it's taking care of its uh, its heating and cooling. To uh, kind of put things into perspective, I think Chris will probably get into the details more. Uh, if you're looking at an office building, a traditional office building with an all air system would need 1.5 CFM a square foot to condition it for heating and cooling. If we're using a chill beam system that DOAS would would, all, could, would most likely only be doing 0.3 uh, CFM per square foot. So it's substantial reduction uh, on the, the fan energy side and how much air you need to bring in and the size of the, uh, the duct system. So now the question is, um, you know, why um, hydronic systems, right? We understand how they work, um, you know, this, but electrification is kind of new. Chill beams have been used uh, for a while. And there's two big reasons. One is, uh, you know, just to transport energy. There's a lot of uh, energy benefits you could get from that. Just the way I said just now, you could reduce your fan size to one fifth for a typical office building. So there's a lot of fan horsepower that goes away. Uh, what that gets replaced by is 
the pumping power for water. And water has four times the specific heat compared to uh, uh, compared to air. It's a lot more efficient and effective at moving BTUs from one place to another than air is. Uh, and that's where uh, all the transport energy benefits come from. Another big benefit is the size of your infrastructure. This is uh, this is you know like for like in terms of loads. Something that you would need 18 by 18 inch duct for to provide cooling for the space could be replaced by a seven inch duct for fresh air and just a half inch pipe, uh, you know, which again could be squeezed in into a lot tighter space. What I would encourage you guys, you know, throughout the day is to think about, you know, where that could benefit you guys. You know, for example, if any one of you guys are working with older buildings that might have to be converted to labs, for example, an old office building is, it has a certain size shaft, which may not work if you convert it to lab because labs need a lot more air but chill beams could help because that shaft would most likely now be sufficient to bring the air that you need for the, fre for the, the fresh air side, and then the rest of the circulation happens uh, at the beam itself. But do think about those, those items and bring those questions up as we talk about these items in more detail. So, uh, you know, I wanted to provide just some quick examples on, you know, what the actual setup may look like um, and how it would play back into those low lift temperatures that we talked about. Uh, there's a lot that's happening on this the layout. Don't worry about the details. Uh, but essentially, what's here is you know, a, you know, a call center, um, a floor plate where all of this is open office area where the call center desks are. You'll see an image shortly. Anywhere you see a CB is where the chill beams are, and then on the edges of the building is where the conference rooms and the private offices are. Um, we so these snippets are from our selection software, which Chris will uh, talk about. What I wanted to point out was when we were doing selections, you know, what this project needed was 50, 57 degree temperature for cooling and 105 uh, for heating, and that's what the the selections were based on. Uh, and what this provides you is you know, the loads that we had to uh, we had to take care of for these two zones. And you can see, you know, starting with the open office area, this is where the picture is with all the cubicles for the the call center area and essentially what we used was um, overhead chill beams there's a two uh, 24 inch wide chill beam they were continuous you could see them right there and at the perimeter uh, there were the 12 inch wide beams that's that's what they preferred uh, for the perimeter um, application and you can see those cooling and heating loads uh, you know were comfortably met uh, in fact if you notice uh, for the perimeter example six beams Three GPM for heating, which is half a GPM uh, per beam, uh, you know, and that's at the low end of the beam range. You know, they could take as much as two GPM and do a lot more heating than what was required uh, for these zones. Uh, and then for the conference room areas, this is where they did not want the exposed beam; they wanted the recess beam. So essentially, they used, uh, you know, we call it the recess beam. I call it the chill beam plenum. So if you think about a linear diffuser, typically it has a plenum behind it. You basically take that plenum out and replace it with this beam. That's what that is, right? And, and that's exactly what's happening here. There's a beam right behind this linear. This is where the return air slot is. Return air goes up into the ceiling plenum, gets induced over the coil, and is discharged on the room side to provide uh, heating and cooling. You can see the facades are pretty high uh, in that application. Oops, jumped too soon a couple of things i wanted to point out was uh you know this building had floor to ceiling facade and the ceilings were quite high i think they were uh, 13 14 feet for an office floor um uh, you know and because of that you could see we had roughly about a thousand btus per lineal foot that we had to offset at the perimeter which is a little bit on the high side and we were able to achieve that using 105 degree water and you notice heating discharge air temperature was pretty close to 90 which is important for a climate like here uh, to be able to effectively heat uh, and wash your facade and provide heating uh, for colder climates like this. All right, there's other ways of creating decoupled uh, cooling systems as well. This one example is a sensible cooling fan power box. You know, essentially, we've already talked about chill beams and how they work. If you think about a chill beam, take the nozzle out and replace it with a fan. That's essentially what this is, you know, or the other way of thinking about it is you guys are probably familiar with fan powered boxes. You take one side out and slap a sensible cooling coil on the side of it. And now you've created a sensible uh, fan powered box. 
the advantage is you, you have more control over ramping your fan up and down, uh, whereas there might be some limitations uh, you know, with, with, with airflow modulation, especially at low airflows with chill beams. Um, and those, those coils could also be four pipe. They could provide both cooling and heating. Um, and they, these coils work with the same exact temperatures that typically your chill beams would. So this coil could you know, do very similar performance at 57 and 105 degree, uh, just the way a chill beam did in the previous example. One item to note is it's not a fan coil. A fan coil is built very differently. That's designed for condensing uh, operation. This is a sensible only fan box, and that's where the key is with low lift. Because it's a sensible only, it means now you want to use 55, 57 degree water, not 42 degree water. Because 42 degree water is where you condense, and your plant is not efficient. Uh, this way, you're not condensing, your coil is clean, and your central plant is a lot more efficient because of the reasons that we just talked about. Um, how do you want to look at those? Uh, you know, essentially, you know, what we a lot of the times what happens is we get into the silos if I'm designing a chill beam project or I'm designing a sensible fan powered uh, box project. Really, the the, uh, the 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 good thing about these products is they work with the same exact infrastructure. They work with same entering water temperatures. They work with same entering air conditions. So you could mix and match them on the same floor plate on the same project. We're starting to see projects that are getting built like that. You know, how, what we typically recommend in terms of how you want to look at it, um, you know, if you have a noise driven uh, space, that's where you want to use chill beams. They don't have any fans, any moving parts, they're very quiet. Your chill beams could provide a lot of benefits. Also, because of the same reasons, chill beams are almost maintenance free, uh, you know, because you don't have bed coils and moving, uh, moving, uh, moving parts in the product. Whereas fan powered boxes, like I said earlier, they provide a little more flexibility in terms of your turn down. Also, if you have large spaces within your floor plate, for example, a large open office area where you may need 10 or 20 chill beams, if you could replace that with a fan powered box, that may provide you some first cost benefits as well because you have less number of connections, uh, pipe connections with a fan powered box than you would with a chill beam. All right, what else could we do? Um, has anyone worked with underfloor air systems in the past? Maybe, sort of. Return function, okay. Uh, you know, they're, so they're a little more popular in, you know, in the financial sector. A lot of the financial firms like using them. Morgan Stanley, uh, you know, JP Morgan Chase, New York City is, is full of these systems. Uh, you know, there's ways to create low lift decoupled cooling systems with underfloor air as well. What you're looking at here is essentially a vertically arranged uh, fan column. Uh, you know, it's, it basically works the same way as that fan powered box that you guys just saw. The difference is, this one feeds multiple zones instead of needing one per zone, right? So you have a fan that pressurizes the floor plenum, and then you have a face and bypass arrangement, right? This is your coil that typically does sensible cooling, and then you've got your, your bypass, and this duct right here is bringing fresh air only, just the way it, it would for a chill beam uh, system or any other decoupled cooling system. So essentially, that's what's happening. Uh, you could see that's just a fresh air uh, inlet and then at the perimeter you could use these perimeter troughs and the way they work is in cooling mode this damper opens up uses plenum air to provide cooling in heating mode the damper is closed and then you may have a natural convective coil that provides heating right at the perimeter just like your baseboard but it's recessed into the floor system right now the limitation is th this could potentially only go down to 140 degrees to provide effective heating. That's where when you go down to really low temperatures like 105, you may need a different version of this product, which we'll talk about in a few slides. So that's kind of the setup of the system itself. Uh, you know, it's also a very, you know, not very, but a lot more decentralized system. You know, compare it to, you know, a floor plate that has one central air, uh, you know, big mechanical room with an air handling unit, right? You've got one place where you're creating all this air. You only have so much control with how you could wrap that system up and down. Typically, you would have four to six of these fan columns on a typical floor plate. And we'll talk about that in a sec in terms of what that looks like. And that inherently provides you more control uh, because you've got multiple units, provides you some redundancy as well. Uh, also, this unit is designed to be quiet. So you could be within 15 foot distance from an occupant 
from this unit, wherever the closet is, and still comply with your class A uh, acoustic or noise requirements uh, for your project. Um, this is the 40-40-40 rule that I was talking about earlier. 40% of energy consumed by uh, you know, by HVAC systems is on the fresh air side. So being able to reduce outdoor air could have a big, big impact on your energy usage. And underfloor air and displacement systems allow you to do that because you're stratifying the air. You could see the stratification temperature rises as, as you go up. 62.1 allow you to use, you know, 1.2 ventilation effectiveness, which reduces the amount of outdoor air uh, you're bringing into your system. And last point on this slide, <coughs> You know, what we're starting to see now is because of these uh, fan columns or air towers and you could be closer to the occupied space, you essentially could eliminate all ductwork from underneath the plenum. What that means is there's no ductwork, so you could lower the raised access floor height. Traditionally, you may have to do a project with 14, 16 inch uh, high raised access floor. With this system, you could be as low as eight inches. You know, there's a project that um, actually Matt and I worked on, uh, Morgan Stanley, which the entire project is all chill beams, um, but they had this one section, I think it was a kitchen area, a cafeteria area, where they were they were worried about some excessive humidity because of all the cooking and everything else. So they, they did not want to use chill beams in that space, but we used the same infrastructure, same water, same fresh air. Instead of chill beams, we had about an eight inch high raised access floor on that project, used this product with some floor diffusers and troughs at the perimeter and that took care of, of that space uh, and works uh, works very well. Uh, only that area had the raised access floor, but it's a good question because, you know, again, traditionally, if, if you have a 16 inch high raised access floor, to be ADA compliant, you need a, a 16 foot long ramp. Uh, right, one, one is to 12 ratio, you need a 16 foot ramp. But now because you could go eight inches, we've actually done projects, retrofit projects. You come out of the elevator and there's just an eight foot ramp and you walk onto uh, you know, um, uh, an underfloor air plenum that's eight inches high and you've created this system. Not just computer room, this is the entire floor plate, the entire office. Yeah, just like the computer room, yes, yeah. Uh, so to show you guys an example, this is this is a quadrant of a floor plate. There's the fan column room. There were four on this project, one in each quadrant. And essentially this fan column is, is pressurizing the floor plenum. You could see floor diffusers uh, next to all the cubicles, uh, you know, where, where people are to provide cooling. At the perimeter, there's these troughs that are providing uh, heating and cooling at the perimeter itself. But that's how you would do it. You would have four little closets like this. You know, the, if you would do it the traditional way, you would need a bigger mechanical room, which could be the size of this elevator riser. Uh, you know, if you were doing a traditional horizontally laid out uh, air handling unit. Um, this is just an example of you know all, all the different fan columns uh, that we have, different sizes. For this project, we used a PFC 75, and you could see we used 55 degree water uh, to create the cooling that we needed for that project. Um, and then these are the, the perimeter troughs where we use 105 and 55 degree of water to provide the cooling and the heating right at the perimeter uh, for the project. So um, one of the things uh, before we wrap up in terms of your perimeter troughs, there's various different options. You know, we've had perimeter troughs for 15, 20 years. We started with that product. That's the one that I talked about that provides natural convection, but it also has the ability, it's hard to see, but there's a damper uh, at the bottom of this unit that could use a plenum air and force that air over the coil. There's a coil in the top section to provide heating and cooling um, at the perimeter, um, and that's needed when you're, when you're working with 105 degree uh, temperature, but you could see you could get a lot of heating uh, out of that product at 105, and obviously 55 works for it as well. Same thing with this product. This product is arranged a little bit differently. Uh, you know, for different application, it has a side inlet instead of a bottom inlet, also known as an underfloor air chill beam. It uses plenum air, again, to move air over cooling coil or a heating coil to provide heating and cooling right at the perimeter. Uh, the important thing about those two troughs is they're designed to work with underfloor air specific uh, plenum pressures. Underfloor air typically is sized for 0.05 inches of static, very low. 
which makes the system very energy efficient. And these products and these coils are sized to use 0.05 inches of static to provide all of this heating, cooling, and airflow uh, within the space itself. So that's a little bit about the underfloor air side. You could see those two products need plenum air. This product right here does not need any plenum air. This works on room air. The way this is arranged is you've got this coil and then you have a tangential fan. This fan pulls the air in from the room side and blows it over the coil to provide heating and cooling. And that coil uh, could be both chilled water and hot water. They're starting to become a lot more popular. They're actually starting to replace all the baseboard heaters that typically go in the elevator uh, lobby area because your baseboard heaters really can't work with water effectively, especially for a climate uh, here in Boston, but these products can. Uh, they could provide you a lot of heating um, and you know, being able to do what needs to be done uh, for, uh, for heating and cooling the space. Any questions on the product side? All right, um, we'll keep going. Uh, you know, this is this is a lot last slide and I'll, I'll wrap up my section and then uh, we'll take a quick break. Um, essentially, we talked about all these products that you see on your screen. Uh, you know, some uh, the, the key takeaways, you know, from this conversation, one is, you know, hopefully you guys see it, the lower the lift, the more energy efficient your system could be. If you have been pushed to provide electrification, if you have been pushed to provide higher and higher efficiency through your systems, lower lift systems is the way to go. They could really, even with all the, the, the aggressive stipulations on the recent energy code uh, standards, with lower lift, you could push the envelope and go beyond uh, where the standards are. Uh, they, could, they could help you with your stretch goals uh, and your clients uh, that, need, that have aggressive energy goals. At the same time, all these products you know, can help you work with those lower lift uh, systems. You know, we talked about 15 to 18% more heating plant efficiency, 26% cooling plant efficiency, all of that could be achieved um, using these products. And there's additional benefits, lower BTU transport energy. We talked about that using water instead of air can provide substantial energy benefits, more control over your fresh air. We talked about that 40-40-40 rule, 40% 40 of the energy is going on the fresh air side. Because fresh air is dedicated, not mixed in within one air handling unit, you have a lot more control over how much you bring in and how much you send to each zone. That just allows you to have better control uh, and hence provide a more effective uh, you know, energy usage within the building. And last but not least, anytime you have a decoupled system, you've got more of an ability to turn a system off within a zone. If there's a floor space where half the floor needs heating or cooling, the other half doesn't need anything, you have more control over turning it off and there's no other system more efficient than the one that's turned off, right? So you've got the capability of doing that with a lot of these uh, these decoupled systems. <clears throat>